You might have thought that the result of all this affluence, spread of education, and so on, would be for an intellectual like Shaw and a literary person a huge boom. And indeed it was. Shaw was a playwright, and he was a very successful playwright. His plays continued to be produced. They were very popular at the time. They made him a wealthy man. And yet Shaw's reaction to the huge advances, you might say, in the human condition over the previous century is not one of feeling on top of the world. It's quite the opposite. It's a sort of boredom, a sort of cynicism, a hostility to traditional values. And we'll see that in, in particular, this section of the play Man and Superman that is called Maxims for Revolutions. It's really not Shaw in his own voice. It's Shaw speaking through the play's protagonist, but it's his revolutionary manual. And so we'll look at what Shaw has to say there. It's both funny and also <laughs> deeply cynical. Now, Shaw was a committed socialist, at least until after World War I, when he seemed to lose faith in government in general. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1925. He also won an Oscar much later for Pygmalion, which got turned into the musical My Fair Lady. He was one of the founders of the Fabian Society. The Fabian Society was founded in Britain in 1884 to advance the cause of socialism. It had many famous, famous members, George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, <coughs> Catalog Ellis, Virginia Woolf, Sidney and Beatrice Webb. We're going to meet some of these people later. And it ended up founding the Labour Party. There you see the symbol of the Fabian Society in its early days. What is that? A wolf in sheep's clothing, exactly. The idea was that one was to introduce socialism gradually so that people did not realize what was happening. If you did it right away, the socialists thought, people are going to rebel against this and not let you do it, so you have to do it subtly, you have to do it quietly and softly in the background, hence the wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, here's another image of the Fabian Society, this one in stained glass. What's happening there? Yes, they're forging a new world and smashing the old. Those guys on the right have hammers, they're taking them to the world, smashing up the old world. Guy on the left is operating a forge, he's going to forge a new one. And then here are all these people in prayer, but what you see in the middle there are a bunch of socialist texts and not the Bible. <laughs> okay, now, what is socialism exactly? It's something that's going to come up again and again in this course, so it's an idea we have to confront private and fun. We face the same problem here we did with conservatism, and we will later with progressivism and liberalism and fascism and communism and so on. A lot of these terms are not really defined very precisely by historians and by political theorists, and so we'll be trying to introduce somewhat more precise definitions, but as I do that, in every case, I'm going to warn you that I'm to some extent trying to make more precise here an idea that has very fuzzy edges, and so I don't want you to think that it's quite as clear cut as I'm going to try to make it. We philosophers like clarity, so I'm going to take this historical and political messiness and try to put it in a structure for you, but inevitably when I put it in that structure, there's a little bit of distortion that goes on just because I'm making something fuzzy seem more precise. On the other hand, I can't stand the fuzziness, so I have to do it. <laughs> now, here's a definition of socialism. This comes from one of socialism's great enemies, not its friend, Friedrich Hayek, who wrote a book called The Road to Serfdom, Attacking Socialism. Nevertheless, it is a pretty precise definition, and a helpful one, I think, because it captures some very general features of socialism. He defines it as the centralized, conscious direction of social forces to consciously chosen ends. And there are several things there that are really important. Centralized, first of all. It's the question of a central government making decisions for the entire society, for the entire economy. That centralization is an important component of socialism. Secondly, conscious direction of social forces. The idea is that people are consciously to direct things, not simply allow them to develop as they might otherwise. It's contrasted, if you want to think of it this way, with an evolutionary model where people just respond in a different way and society evolves. Here the idea is, no, don't let it evolve in whatever way uh, instead, force it to go in certain directions, make conscious decisions about the end of the state, and consciously decide on methods. And so it does include both the consciously chosen ends, this is what you want society to look like, but then also the conscious choice of means to that end. So here's a way of contrasting it with 
a view that is more dependent on, well, has a more central place for liberty, free enterprise, if you want to think of it in economic terms, or more broadly, a more libertarian outlook. Socialism has decision-making be centralized, and alternative views are highly decentralized. We're made cautious decisions about ends and means, as opposed to market-driven decisions or decisions that evolve, basically, in society as well. We are to direct social forces, as opposed to having social forces evolve on their own. And finally, we're to choose ends cautiously as opposed to ends that are the result of free choices made by individuals. You might say the alternative here is a society where people individually decide what they want to do, and then what happens to society at large? Well, it's just whatever happens when people do what they want to do. And so nobody's really sitting there thinking, ah, oh, an ideal society would look like this. People are just doing their thing, and some major of society results. The socialist says, well, too often that's going to lead to the wrong kind of result. What you have to do is get people together and make con sorry, conscious, centralized decisions about what ends to pursue and how to pursue them. Well, as I mentioned, Shaw remained a socialist until after World War I. And then when he saw the destruction of the war and its aftermath, he ended up becoming more cynical. Earlier, he was a believer in government, but became, well, was kind of cynical about the individual people and their choices. He then became even more cynical about the whole shebang, including government. Uh, here's a quote from one of his later writings. It said that every people has a government it deserves. It's more to the point that every government has the electorate it deserves. For the orators of the front bench can edify or debauch or ignorant electorate of will. Thus our democracy moves in a vicious circle of reciprocal worthiness and unworthiness. So he saw that in a democratic society, at least, government and the people go together, a bad government makes the people worse, a bad people makes a bad government, and so on, and he saw things in a downward spiral. <laughs> in a work called Back from the Puzzle, written in 1921, there's this famous quotation, you see things and you say, why? But I dream things that never were, and I say, why not? This is a quotation that was made famous later by Robert Kennedy, who used it in the 60s to inspire people in his speeches. But actually, in the play, this is something said by the serpent to Eve in regard to offering it the act. <laughs> you see things and you say, why? Wow. But I dream things that never were, and I say, why? Why not? Why the act? Well, in any event, however that may be, Shaw's socialism turned into cynicism. He saw people electing foolish leaders like Mussolini's and Hitler's, and thought that all of this was tending in a very bad direction. But I want to focus not on the later cynicism, but on the cynicism that was already there in 1903. What we read for today is an appendix to the play Man and Superman. That title comes from Nietzsche. Nietzsche had the idea, as an aspect of his thought that appears later and we didn't really talk about, but his idea is that mankind is evolving, evolving into, well, what he referred to as the Ubermensch, the Overman, the Superman. And the Superman comics and so on are actually kind of a play on Nietzsche's idea. Although he doesn't evolve out of human beings. He comes from the planet of Krypton and all of that. But nevertheless, <laughs> there's something like this. We're evolving to a new state. A new kind of human being and a new state beyond would need. Well, what would that be like? Pause for a moment and think about a higher human being. Suppose evolution does continue and we are evolving. What will humanity look like in a thousand years, in a hundred thousand years? How are we evolving? What would that be like? Yeah? Would it be way bigger? All right, over the last couple of centuries, people have gotten bigger. And part of that is our diets have improved a lot, our health has improved a great deal. You might imagine that process continues. And so, by the, you know, maybe a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, people will kind of back on us and think, what tiny people did they fit into these seats? Well, let's hope it's because they're large and muscular and athletic, not because they're all obese. <laughs> 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 the way evolution's going, I don't know, which is more likely. But yeah, you might think, yeah, that's one thing that's been happening over the last few hundred years. You might expect that process to continue. What else? Yeah, we've generally become more literate. We have become more literate, and so people do a lot more reading. 
Uh, people of your generation probably read fewer books than people of my generation did. On the other hand, you're reading things online all the time. So probably overall you spend much more of your time reading than people did back in my day. Uh, even though most of it seems to be about cats. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a joke. But anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there is a lot that people are becoming more literate. Psychologists have discovered the Flynn effect, which means every generation, IQ points on average, seem to increase about 15 points. Uh, and so people seem to be getting smarter and smarter. Um, <laughs> there's not a lot to Well, I shouldn't say that, actually. There has been a tremendous growth of education. Urbanization is part of this. But in a sense, people are becoming more and more equipped to deal with more complex problems. People are becoming more literate, they're becoming smarter. You might think that process is going to continue. What else? Yeah. With medicine getting better, people live longer? Good, people live longer. And in fact, there's all sorts of research being done now on turning off aging. That doesn't mean we'd be immortal, but if you could find a way to turn off the gene that ages you, that would have a tremendous effect. People might still die, but they could live for possibly hundreds of years until they might die from a disease or by accident, but there would be fewer and fewer diseases, and so you might think lifespans are going to get longer and longer. From one point of view, it's very discouraging that the biblical account of our lifespan is three score and 10, i.e. 70 years. And now the average lifespan for somebody in the United States is, I think, 78 if you're a man and 82 if you're a woman. That's only an increase of about, well, less than 10%. What? Well, about 10% for men and about 15% for women over the past several thousand years. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, that's not allowing for differences in childhood mortality and other things that have made huge differences. But still, it seems as if we're on the verge of transforming things in such a way that people might be able to live much, much longer lives. And that's so, so the over men that we're envisioning might be people who are smarter than we are, bigger and stronger than we are, healthier than we are, who might have lifespans of two, three, four hundred years. I mean, imagine. The philosophy department could still have Dave Hart as its chair. <laughs> yeah, he's been chairman for 400 years. <laughs> Kant's only been here for 200, but he's counting. Uh, anyway, I mean, it leads to all sorts of amazing possibilities, but also problems. You could think, wait, how are young people going to ever fit into the system if it's clogged with all these 400-year-olds? <laughs> Still, fascinating possibility. My generation might be the last generation to die within what we consider a normal lifespan. Other possible changes. Yeah? Universal language. A universal language. Yeah, early in the 20th century, some people got together and said, yes, part of what caused World War I and caused all sorts of other problems is that people speak different languages and they don't actually understand one another. And so there was an attempt to create a universal language. And so people actually thought one up. It's called Esperanto. And it still has a few dozen speakers. <laughs> uh, but I mean, really, it was kind of bogus. What it came down to is they were all European, and they said, well, let's take some words from French and from Italian and from Spanish and from German and put them together and call it language. Um, actually, what's been happening over the past century is that more and more people are speaking the same languages, but it's a relatively small number of languages. It's not one universal one, but a vast proportion of the world now speaks English. A vast proportion speaks Spanish. A vast proportion speaks Chinese. And then a very large number speak Hindi. Um, and I guess Arabic is another very large uh, linguistic unit. Um, smaller languages are tending to die out at the same time that a handful of languages are starting to dominate the world scene. So before, you might say, gosh, to communicate with people, even in Europe, you might have to learn dozens of languages. Now, that's much less true. Really, you can, if you know one of those five languages I mentioned, you already can communicate with some vast number of people. Well, in any event, you could think there is a tremendous change that's gone on and continuing to go on. It might be that we are at the verge of a new kind of person. And what interests Shaw is this Nietzschean idea that it might be a kind of person beyond good and evil that will discard the kinds of norms we've lived by now and live by a new set of norms. And so in Maxims for Revolutionists, he proposed some of these new norms, mocking the old ones and suggesting that there might be new rules to live by. So for example, the golden rule, that's something that is at the foundation of Judeo-Christian ethics. Treat others as you would want to be treated. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. 
Kant tries to take this idea and make it a general moral principle. Don't make an exception for yourself. Kant says the basic moral problem is that people are constantly trying to do that. Is the murderer, for example, somebody who's living by a different set of rules? No. What happened to the murderer and say, is it okay if I kill you? You think it's okay to kill, right? So may I kill you? <laughs> the murderer isn't going to say, oh, well, I guess I should be consistent. Sure, go ahead and kill me. <laughs> uh, no. Can you go and steal from a thief and have the thief say, that's cool. I believe in the ethic of stealing. No. And so these aren't people who are living by a different set of rules. They're living by the same set of rules, uh, or else let's say they're advocating the same set of rules, but they're making an exception for themselves. They're saying, well, you can't kill me, but I can kill you. You can't rob from me, but I can rob from you. And that's the problem. So Kant says, here's what we have to do. Treat others with the dignity and respect that we would like to be accorded. But this is an idea that Shaw makes fun of. He says, don't do unto others as you would that they should do unto you. Their taste may not be the same. Now, first of all, notice the underlying relativism. Hey, it's a matter of taste. What would you like somebody to do for you? Maybe you think, man, I'm really thirsty. I want somebody to go buy me a Coke. Does that mean you should go buy people Cokes? Well, no. <laughs> that's something that's a matter of taste. It's sort of a temporary condition. Is that what the golden rule implies? In other words, here's what I want us to think about as we go through. Are these serious criticisms of these doctrines, or are they just jokes? That, is that a serious criticism of the golden rule? Their taste might not be the same. Yeah, it's satire. It's, well, it is satire, yeah. And so, partly, he's trying to be funny. Now, this one isn't very funny. We'll see some that are funny. And sometimes, I think there's a real point behind the, the humor and the satire. And sometimes there isn't. It's really just, he's playing it for laughs. And this one, it's hard to say. It's not that funny, number one. Number two, it's, it's hard to tell whether that's a very serious criticism. Yeah. Well, right, I think what he is in part worried about is, does this mean other people can force their tastes on me, their religion on me, their ethics on me, their politics on me, their whatever it is on me? Um, after all, if I would like to be, maybe I in fact think I'm weak-willed should be forced into doing certain things that I think are right, does that mean I should force others into doing those things I think are right? And so there is a kind of serious worry underlying this, and I think a lot of these are like that. Here's another version, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's something that appears in lots of different places, in the Hebrew Bible as well as in the New Testament. And here's his take on that. Don't love your neighbor as yourself. If you're on good terms with yourself, it's an impertinence, if on bad, an injury. Well, once again, it's sort of relevant, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Do I want you to love me as you love yourself? I don't know. How do you feel about yourself? <laughs> you yeah. asking, right? And, you know, there's a point to that. Here's maybe the most interesting one. The golden rule is that there are no golden rules. What does that mean? There are no absolutes. There are no absolutes. Yes. Here I point out he's challenging this enlightenment idea that there are laws of morality as well as laws of science. But it is more general than that. He's attacking the idea of absolutes. In that sense, too, this is a very Nietzschean pocket. <laughs> you can almost imagine that his revolutionary here has read his Nietzsche, hence the title of the play, and Superman, and is thinking, well, okay, <laughs> yeah, there are no golden rules. Just as Nietzsche says, there are no eternal facts, there are no absolute truths, everything varies with the time period in which it's being thought about and written. So here, there are no golden rules, there are no universal principles. You make it up as you go along. He also confronts the idea of temptation. All of it, the Roman poet talks about this. He defines weakness of will as knowing the better and doing the worse. And that's a common problem. In morality, it's not just a question of making an exception for yourself. Often you know what the right thing is to do, but nevertheless you're tempted by something else and you end up not doing what you think you actually ought to do. There are lots of instances of this kind of temptation, right? Of weakness of will, giving in and actually doing the worse when you know what the better thing to do is. Give me some examples. We've all lived with this sort of problem. What are some cases where you know what you want to do, but you don't do it? Junk food, somebody says. Yes. 
going to a party when you ought to be studying. Yes. Do you mess up at work or something? Do you know you should really kind of confess it? Good. You, you mess up. You know you should say what you've done, but instead you try to cover it over and what people won't notice. Other examples? Procrastination. Procrastination. Good. These things happen all the time. And so what's to be said about that? Well, the traditional thing to say about that is, look, you know what the better thing is to do. You've got to force yourself to do it. Here is a dramatic and classic statement of the problem. Paul says this in Romans, I don't understand what I do. For, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I don't do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. And so he's describing this problem of weakness of will. And Paul ends up saying, look, I feel like a stranger to myself. I feel torn apart. I feel as if there is something inside me that will not let me do what I want to do. So artwork dealing with temptation has been a common theme, sometimes depicting the fall, sometimes in other contexts. Here you see Eve saying, no, not the apple. <laughs> and this is called temptation. I don't know why. The mom and baby with the apple, but I think that's cool. Anyway, here is a classic statement from the Gospels. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Well, from 1 Thessalonians, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Shaw's response, never resist temptation. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. What is he saying? Yeah. He's uh, saying hold fast, which is good, meaning like enjoy your life, kind of, right? So, yeah. what you want to do if you want to ride a roller coaster instead of going and studying in the library, go to an amusement park. Enjoy your life while you have it. Okay, yeah, good. Seize the day. Go enjoy your life while you have it. Don't resist temptation. How do you even know what's good? Think about Ovid's definition knowing the better and doing the worse. How do you know what's better until you've tried it? Okay, back in the 60s, I knew people who were like this, okay? Uh, I was, I was spending my time in the library, like any good boy should. Uh, well, either that or watching baseball or playing baseball. I did a lot of baseball back then. Uh, and that came to nothing. Uh, <laughs> uh, it wasn't all my fault. I was a pretty good pitcher, but I got hit in the head with a line drive. That'll end your career pretty fast. <laughs> um, but it did freak people out because I had an eye that swelled up like this. And for months, my, the white part of my eye was a dark red. And that freaked people out. You know, you just say, I didn't wear glasses in those days either. I could just look at people and go, <laughs> And when you're a junior high school, that seems cool. Uh, but in any event, now that's a temptation I guess I did give into. Uh, but yes, the whole idea is, look, how do you know what's good? Try it out and find out. And so, hey, drugs, you know if that's good? Try them, try them out. <laughs> um, there, the sister of a friend of mine uh, described for him making love to an enormously fat man. And he said, well, if he was so fat and sort of disgusting, why'd you do it? Well, I wanted to see what it was like. Uh, <laughs> she's one of those people who changed her name and moved to a commune in commune up, upstate New York. I don't know what became of her. But in, anyway, she had that sort of, ah, okay, I won't do this temptation, I'll go and I'll see what's for myself what's right and what's wrong, what's good and bad. And that's his idea. Look, how do you know until you've tried it out? Here's another one. How do you respond to people who injure you? Don't resist an evil person. If someone strikes you in the right cheek, turn it in the other also. That's Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. Shaw's response? Beware of the man who does not return your blow. He neither forgives you nor allows you to forgive yourself. And he has other stray sayings that reflect on the same thing. If you injure your neighbor, better not do it by halves. <laughs> You're going to hurt him, hurt him good, so he doesn't hurt you back. Um, well, okay, this is satire. It's part of fun. But he's also poking fun at a traditional system of morality, saying, actually, this isn't a sensible way to live. And he's trying to argue for some kind of alternative. There are all sorts of other Enlightenment ideals he mocks. It isn't all just Judeo Christian morality, though that's his favorite target. There are other targets, too. The idea of progress. 
what, what might be described as the central idea of the 19th century, the possibility and increasingly the reality of human progress, his response is this. Decadence can find agents only when it wears the mask of progress. So where other people might see progress throughout the 19th century, he sees decadence. What does decadence mean? Well, a falling away, falling away from traditional values. And it's that falling away that he doesn't, he's not dismayed about, he's in effect encouraging and urging people to fall away. What about reason? That was one of our enlightenment principles. He says the man who listens to reason is lost. It enslaves all whose minds are not strong enough to master her. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Well, it isn't just reason. What about justice? He says, the love of fair play is a spectator's virtue, not a principle's. In other words, if you're playing the game, you want to cheat. You only care about justice if you're on the sidelines. <laughs> what about marriage? Ah, it's popular because it combines the maximum of temptation with the maximum of opportunity. Ah, what about education? When a man teaches something he doesn't know to somebody else who has no aptitude for it, and gives them a certificate of proficiency, the latter is completely the education of a judgment. A fool's brain digests philosophy into folly, science into superstition, and art into pedantry. Hence, university education. <laughs> he who can does. He who cannot teaches. That's probably the most famous of all these sayings. And Woody Allen is saying that you can't teach, teaches Jim. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, notice what's happening here. He's basically saying, well, those people who can do things, they go out and do. Those who can't do, they teach them. Okay, so basically they end up teaching things they don't know how to do. And so they teach sort of false knowledge to people who really aren't, in most cases, aren't that interested anyway. Uh, education, somebody else later said in the same spirit, is a question of casting false pearls before real swine. <coughs> Okay, that, that insults both of us. <laughs> Don't feel bad. I'm not saying this shot is something. Okay, a learned man is an idler who kills time to study. Beware of his false knowledge, it's more dangerous than ignorance. No man can be a pure specialist without being, in the strict sense, an idiot. <laughs> now, he's mocking, in other words, these new educational structures, universities, other kinds of schools. He says, in the end, activity is the only road to knowledge. Every fool believes what his teachers tell him and calls it credulity science or morality, as confidently as his father called it divine revelation. It's the same impulse in all of these cases, he's saying. When he also mocks ideals of liberty and equality, he mocks the idea of property, which he says is theft, <laughs> government, the organization of idolatry, democracy, well, <laughs> It substitutes the election by the incompetent, many, for appointment by the corrupt few. Civilization is a disease. And now there are two things he says right near the end that I think are important. And so let me just mention those in the last two minutes here. One is, the imagination can't conceive a vile criminal that he should build another London like the present, nor a greater benefactor than he should destroy. Shaw sees no downside to changing the status quo. He says, suppose everything I'm trying to do would destroy civilization as we know it. Ah, we're better off. We couldn't do worse than produce London like the current London. Even though, keep in mind, London at this time was the most prosperous, the most advanced, the most civilized place in the world. There's London in 1903. And Shaw basically says, it's worthless. <laughs> no viler criminal could be the, than the one who would recreate it. No greater benefactor than the person who might destroy it. Well, he will get his wish in a few decades, <laughs> but we'll come back to that. The other thing I wanted to mention is this. You can't believe in honor to you Better keep yourself clean and bright. You are the window through which you must see the world. That seems to me actually a very important and interesting insight. And it's a thought we're going to encounter later when we talk about Iris Bernard. So we'll defer it until then. But what I want you to see is Shaw's posing a sharp challenge to the traditional views of the enlightenment, of morality, of religion, of science, of education. And I want you to think about how serious those challenges are.
turn this off first. Yeah.